One liner. When okay. shooting a mine, don't use a silencer or his friends will hear you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Erickson, um, daughter of uh, Susan Erickson. And I wanted to share um, my favorite poem uh, that is very, very well known. It's very famous um, by Digby, uh, The Kids Who Were Different, which I'm sure all of you have read or heard or heard him um, uh, read aloud, and I heard Digby read this poem aloud when I was a teenager, and um, it just had such an impact on me, um, because here was this man who truly believed that um, a weirdo like myself should be celebrated, and I can't tell you how much um, I appreciated that, and so this is the poem, uh, heard around the world by the geeks and the losers alike, <laughs> The Kids Who Are Different by Digby Wolf. Here's to the kids who are different. The kids who don't always get A's. The kids who have ears twice the size of their peers and noses that go on for days. Here's the kids who are different. The kids they call crazy or dumb. The kids who don't fit with the guts and the grit who dance to a different drum. Here's to the kids who are different. The kids with the mischievous streak. For when they have grown, as history has shown, it's their difference that makes them unique. Hey guys, I'm Rusty Rutherford. Um, I didn't actually know Digby personally, but I thought this was an open mic and I didn't make any much stage time. <laughs> uh, I took many classes with Digby. Um, the first one was my second semester here, and it was a 500 level class, and I remember I had to talk my way into it, and I, I got to brag to all the other theater kids that I was only a freshman taking a 500 level class and that it was way easier than all the 100 level classes. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Digby was awesome, and uh, that poem, The Kids Who Are Different, the first time I heard that poem, I had actually moved out to Chicago after college. I was out there for about a year, um, pretty broke, pretty depressed. My mom called me, and she was reading Goldie Hawn's biography, and she said, I found this quote from your professor, Digby Wolf, and she read that to me, and it couldn't have came at a better time. Because uh, I was still a kid. I'm still a kid. I want to always be a kid. And I think that's something that Digby kind of hopefully installed into all of us. Um, and my buddy Carl, who's here tonight, we, we met through the theater department, did one of Digby's classes together. He texted me this morning and asked if I was dressing somber or like a comedian. <laughs> uh, I don't really know the difference. <laughs> But I dressed like this, like I would in one of Digby's classes, and that was the great thing about Digby's classes, is he accepted everybody, no matter how they dressed, no matter how weird they were, no matter how their feet were in the seats, or their nipples weren't hanging out of their shirt, I don't know, he accepted everyone, he almost encouraged us to be freaks. And um, <laughs> I, I love Digby's classes because it was more than just a class, it was more than just a lecture. He always opened the class with a, a sort of vaudeville act, if you guys remember um, Dusty McGowan. Uh, him and Dusty would always do this act at the beginning of class where they brought out a TV and they'd plug it in and they'd try to figure out how the VCR worked. <laughs> and Dusty would finally get the VCR set and then Digby would walk around the other side and hit the wrong button and it went on. That's how we spent the first 15 minutes of each class. <laughs> um, uh, and he, I remember once, uh, Al Franken was in town and they wanted Digby to open for him a few years back, and Digby agreed to do it only under the terms that he got every one of his students in the show for free, which is cool, because we were all broke and you and tuition. So he got us into the Alfred Franken show for free, and that's the heart that Digby had, you know, he was always trying to help others, he was always looking out for others, um, and it was the same with comedy, that's what he taught, you know, comedy or performing wasn't about getting your funny laughs across, it was about talking from your heart and taking that stuff that's killing you and tearing you up, or that stuff you love, or that stuff that is bugging you, or that girl at work, taking that stuff, that pain, that angst, that fun, <laughs> and making it funny, and letting other people laugh at you, because they're going to anyways. Might as well laugh at yourself at the same time. <laughs> and uh, the biggest compliment I ever received, I think one of the biggest ones from anybody, was actually through Digby, third hand. I, I heard it from Carl. He had told my buddy Carl this. Um, I had left, they were talking about me, and he said, Rusty Rutherford, that, that, that kid has balls the size of Volkswagens. <laughs> um, and it's actually a condition I have, I didn't know you <laughs> But that's 
one thing that has really kept me going. Like when I just see myself slumping back and getting bored and doing the same old stuff, I remember that quote. And I hope all of you guys, whether I think Phoebe would want you guys, whether you're comedians, businessmen, teachers, um, hairstylists, whatever you do, I think you should remember that and just have balls the size of a Volkswagen, do it all, falls out for Digby. <laughs> Love you, Digby. Thanks, guys. Oh, well, it fits me perfectly. <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence is no match for natural stupidity. <laughs> My name is Elsa Gay, and some of you remember me back in the days when I worked here. Some of the happiest years of my career at UNM were in this building. Um, Digby came many years after I had left. But uh, I needed to say something, and I asked Patricia if this is appropriate, and she said yes, it was. Um, as was mentioned earlier, <clears throat> Digby was an alcoholic, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, that's where our friendship uh, rested. And uh, he, like I, became uh, involved in Alcoholics Anonymous a long time ago. And um, so our friendship, even though when we met for coffee, <clears throat> I always wanted to hear the latest dirt from the <laughs> College of Fine Arts. <laughs> um, we'd settled down and grown up, and uh, we would talk about recovery. And um, if when, after I heard about um, the, the memorial service being set for this day, I just took it upon myself personally not to advertise um, to the AA community that this was happening, because in large part because I, I know I know this theater department and I know Digby's role here, and uh, if if I had started to invite some of the alcoholics in Albuquerque that knew and loved Digby, first of all, you wouldn't have had any seats. Um, <laughs> the place would have been full. They would have eaten all the cookies in the <laughs> drank all the coffee before this even started. <laughs> and, um, but um, if it, those, obviously, everybody here knows him well. And if you can imagine what kind of a um, story he had to tell other alcoholics, and that's how we stay sober, is that we tell each other what it was like, and then we tell each other what happened, and then we tell each other what it's like now. And uh, this has brought <clears throat> um, hope and life um, to, of course, millions of alcoholics, but here in Albuquerque, um, your friend Digby had a had a profound influence that I think in many ways was equal to, if not greater than those of you that were students of his. And uh, to say that the AA community is going to miss Digby, uh, once again, is putting it mildly. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brian Fair. I took Digby's uh, comedy writing class three times. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, from Steve Perot, um, a friend from Canada. In a dream, Digby sits at a plain wooden desk. The room is like a library, walls lined with books, sunlight through the window. He rises from the desk like some sprite, a disorganized dream of papers in hand, and flings the papers up towards the ceiling as they flutter down randomly. Students suddenly materialize and scramble to catch the fluttering sheets before they hit the floor. For scrawled on each paper is a coded note, an enigma which will disappear once it hits the floor and be lost forever. Some are clutched and saved, many others hit the floor. And while the students continue to scramble, he scampers into the next room and again the ruffled papers flung into the air and new students appear and clutch and clamor and the whole show repeats and repeats again. New rooms, new notes, new students, Digby is. To describe a person by his accomplishments is flattering but often facile. To honor him for what he is is much harder. For what a person is is elusive, and words often fall short and fail to capture the essence. For Digby is so much more than just a list of credits at the end of a film. And to recite a litany of attributes or even flaws might illuminate the image of a person, but only dimly, for words are flat, and Digby is. It is fitting that Digby's transformation led to Albuquerque, to UNM, to an experimental theater, 
for it is here that his greatest victories are won. Perhaps, perhaps Digby and Dionysus share a muse. We all long for that teacher, larger than life, who carries the muse, who dances through the forest, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs that lead to the enchanted cottage hidden deep in the woods. And if you listen carefully, you can almost hear him caroling to his students as papers flutter through the air in the next room. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Thank you. Patricia, we have a very short uh, email sent from Howard Chang that I wanted to read to you. Dear Miss Manuel, a few days ago I was reminiscing about my time with Dicky and decided to search for information about him. It was then that I very sadly discovered that he had only recently passed away. It was so very long ago, in 1961, when he knelt down beside me to rehearse our Review 61 lines together. Being a 10-year-old, I remember being very nervous about being on TV. But Digby eliminated my fears and enabled it to become a very fond and special memory for me. After all these years, I can still feel Digby's warmth and sincerity. To me, that says everything about Digby. His support is what enabled me to do my co-hosting job. I could not have done it without him. I really appreciate having an opportunity to share this special memory with you. With warm regards, Junior Howard Chain. I haven't been here for a while. My name is Brian Hansen. I actually chaired the search committee that ended up getting the big here. Yeah. I didn't do it alone, and there were some interesting twists. <laughs> Those of you that know the intricate dance with affirmative action at the University of New Mexico understand how, how difficult it can be to hire somebody with the background that Digby Wolf had. Because he didn't have a college degree, nor had he taught in a conventional college situation. And so as we negotiated down to that final list of three, I kept waiting for affirmative action to get back to me on the phone and say, this is not going to fly. But when we submitted the final three and they were accepted, the biggest name was on there, of course, I got a call from Affirmative Action. They said, congratulations. You got a black guy on there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the only possible response for me was to say, really? <laughs> and they said, yeah, look at the name. And uh, <laughs> so I've often thought that just moving from James to Digby Wolf made a big difference for you and him. But this leads into one of the threads of his miraculous life. Um, I mean, his life was a work of art, uh, not always a comedy, as has been alluded to. But let me just give you this one story. Everybody here knows how much Digby loved jazz and was particularly in love with uh, African American culture in the United States. Which leads to a story which may even be true. <laughs> <laughs> during the Second World War, during the Blitz of London, Digby was sent out of London. And he was sent up to, as I recall, Edinburgh, but I'm not sure. At any rate, he was placed in the home of a labor organizer, one of the major labor <coughs> organizers in Edinburgh. And he, uh, they didn't have much room, so he slept in a bed uh, that was just outside the kitchen. One night, he woke in the middle of the night to this wonderful voice singing black gospel. And he looked up through the door, and he saw the first black person he'd ever seen in his entire life. And it was Paul Robeson. <laughs> Paul Robeson was on his way back from a trip to uh, the Soviet Union to build support during the Second World War and was staying with the labor organizer. Now, can you imagine anything but a movie in which that was possible? <laughs> Digby over and over again had these twists and turns and peculiar little secrets coming up. Sometimes he gets for him one final thing. I remember one time he was talking, he said, boy, he said, what are the chances of a, of a race this year? 
course, it was Jim's fault, not mine. <laughs> so we were all bitching in the basement about the quality of the uh, thing. And I said, yeah, it doesn't look good to me. He said, oh, God. He says, I really. And then a couple of days later, he came in and he said, hey, not a problem. Turns out that during one of his disorganized times, he had opened a checking account in Santa, Santa Monica. And they just contacted him. He had $20,000. He never knew he had <laughs> So it was that kind of life that led him to have this, I don't know, detached, crazy view that so worked so well for him and made him so many friends. A life that was, in, in fact, a work of art. Hey guys, my name is Bob Pennington. And I'm here to solve a mystery for you all that was brought up earlier. Um, but first, I'll say a little bit about Digby. Digby was a father I always wanted. And we were friends, so I, you know, he, could, he, could, he could let loose a little bit with me. And if you think of Digby when he was out there a little bit wild, the stories are great, believe me. I've heard a lot of them. But um, Digby did have a home. And I was his landlord. I was lucky enough to be his landlord. <laughs> and as I came over, my daughter couldn't make it, and my wife's with me. Gotta get through this. One of our fondest memories of TV, usually on a Saturday afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the morning, he had a little Toyota pickup truck. And he would come out in his underwear. <laughs> And he put his little towel down in the back of his pickup truck, and he would sunbathe. <laughs> and we'd go over and talk to him, and you know, and have big uh -huh. moments. But thank you, Dickie, that I got these moments with you, and, and uh -huh. it was just you know, what a wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. I'm not sure this line is okay after that. <laughs> we never really grow up. We only learn how to act in public. <laughs> There's a little writing lesson you, you need to share with us. Yeah, that you shared with us at the Frontier, and you'll change the name. Want me to bring in the microphone? <laughs> uh, I'm Aaron Frail. I was one of uh, Digby's students uh, with Rusty and, and many other people. In fact, Rusty has a, a shirt on of a sketch comedy group that uh, I was in that basically everyone was a student of Digby that was part of the sketch comedy group. So. Uh, we really all dedicate a lot of what we decided to do with our lives to Digby. So anyways, uh, I was in a writing class with him in this room, and uh, it was a, I, I will change the names of these uh, students to protect the innocent, but uh, the student was named uh, Fred, and uh, <laughs> Fred had uh, written this sketch that basically involved uh, a character talking about the most vile sex acts that you can possibly think of, and uh, they got worse and worse and worse as the sketch went on, and, and people started leaving in, in class, because it was just too, too disgusting to, uh, <laughs> to, to really, like, you know, repeat what went on in the sketch, and of course, uh, me, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that watches a train wreck to see what's going on, so <laughs> I, I stayed, and I, I, I just like wanted to see how far this was going to go, and, then, and everyone left, and finally it was just him, it was just Fred and Digby left in the room by the time the sketch was over, and, and I'll never forget, uh, Digby said, so I guess we have the lesson here. <laughs> The mechanical encrusted on the living. Hi, I, I'm Dave Landau, uh, and I'm wearing the clothes that Digby always saw me in. And he called it my costume because I'm a psychiatrist. And uh, so I felt I had to put on a tie and jacket to, for this uh, memorial. And uh, there were a variety of things that I wanted to say. I, I won't say them 
all that I want to say uh, that I'm representing my family today. My wife is in the hospital right now, uh, but uh, she wanted me to make sure that I um, uh, said to everyone here uh, the wonderful things that Digby gave to her, which was uh, similarly to what many people here have said, uh, a huge en encouragement uh, to find her uh, um, her spirit uh, in writing. Uh, she is a psychologist, uh, but also wants to write and has been writing because of D Digby's inspiration uh, and encouragement. She also wanted to thank Digby for introducing us to Patricia, uh, who has become uh, another major part of our family. Um, and uh, I also wanted to uh, say that um, he has become part of our children's uh, lives. Uh, our son uh, wanted to make sure that I uh, mentioned that uh, Digby taught him, uh, quote, the anatomy of an ark, uh, close quote. Uh, and uh, our son, uh, who is uh, uh, a sometimes videographer and uh, djembe drummer, um, still is trying to uh, use that idea in, in his work and writings. And uh, our daughter, uh, who is an engineer, uh, also talks about the inspiration that Digby had been giving to her through her uh, upbringing. Uh, she met him as an adult, and uh, she told me this morning the first story she remembers when we, uh, Patricia and uh, our family, uh, went to Hamas Springs uh, in the mid-90s and he said to her uh, that he was the voice of the buzzard in the Jungle Book. Uh, and she said, uh, I, I don't, how do you write that down in your CV? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, do you have any other uh, thoughts about that? And she turned to her daughter, uh, who is now 19, and uh, I did not know this, that uh, our granddaughter, uh, Alexis, said that she has in her bedroom a poem that he wrote to her uh, that she has kept on her wall. Uh, she got the poem uh, when she was three. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote a poem to her on her birthday. I did not know that. And I will be in St. Louis where that family is next week and, and read that poem. Um, and I think that uh, is, is all for me. <laughs> Along with Jim Lunell, I was one of the people that Digby was mad at a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I also did not give him the salary he wanted. Uh, but I was also undergraduate advisor, and I had to tell students over and over again, no, you cannot get credit for repeating this class five and six times. <laughs> and then he would say, why not? And I'd say, because. It's rules. I, I can't give them credit. They can take it, but they can't get credit. Anyway. My best story of Digby is when the MFA was created. Digby quit teaching a lot of undergrads. And Digby came to me once and said, Jim won't let me teach 350, was it 350? Uh, three something. It was the beginning. <laughs> I retired, I've forgotten all those numbers now. But it was the beginning playwriting class because Digby loved the beginner. And why he liked the grad students, he missed the new people, and sometimes he would have as many as 50 people in that class. He'd just keep letting them in. <laughs> and when they would come to me, they would say, he just can let everybody write. He just gets everyone writing. So it was a shame more and more non-majors, young people couldn't have that from Digby. And I was sorry not to give all of you credit. <laughs> <laughs> my friend and colleague, my brother from another mother, <laughs> the Digby James Wolf, 
is our topic. <laughs> you remember Dionysus and Naran, the three weeks, the hundred students? It happened, if truth be told, because of the, his antic drive. He was our Dionysus. I don't believe I ever saw Digby sit down and watch a show in a seat. <laughs> he always stood in one of the entrances to the stage, leaning against the seat bank. For Dig, a theater should be filled with people watching actors make us laugh, take the ride. One day, probably because we were high on post-festival relief, we had one of our signature fantasies. Let me have some water here. One liner. Uh -huh. <laughs> How are you doing? Come on, folks. The vending machine theory. Stuff tastes better when it falls. <laughs> <laughs> Dippy and I scroll down Central, imagining the street filled with young people and floats, bands, dancers, a version of the Brazilian Carnival. We even imagined contests for float design between high schools, drill teams leading the way, teaching the samba, parade as device to excite a city, release creativity, and have a day to slip the leash. We were juiced on our own lunatic ambition. <laughs> but that was Digby, divine madness. As a producer, I've had a bit of a Cecil B. DeMille complex. <laughs> Digby poured gasoline on it <laughs> and lit the match. <laughs> the fantasy shows the heart of the antic disposition. It was unachievable. It would have created a fabulous mess, but pulled into creativity untold numbers of young people and others who momentarily were set free of the everyday to see life move to a different beat, free of constraints. He did that for me, even when we were mad at each other. <laughs> it's a gift, priceless, rare. I loved him for it. The fun and creative hijinks got up with our Digby made it easy to love him. Well, what about that part that made it hard to love him? <laughs> Digby lived with a stubborn and angry demon. He would come out to play when you least expected, or you did, and dreaded it. It was the demon that said, you're not up to it and your work is the equivalent of drag. <laughs> so one day in 2004, I had my conversation with a demon who told me he was leaving and taking Digby with him. <laughs> I didn't treat him right. The department didn't give him the support and acknowledgement he's due. He was disappointed with me for a number of sins and he was taking his marbles and leaving. I understand you when, I understand when you leave a place, you have to create a little wreckage to prove to yourself that where, why would you stay in this dump? I could see there was no talking him out of it, or I, because it hurt, was unwilling. So we had a cold standoff, and as all you know, he left. So there was a not so minor detail we didn't talk about that day. That detail was the fact that we were writing a book together. <laughs> now this is a little awkward. <laughs> I'm an insensitive, 
untalented shit. <laughs> and he was gone. <laughs> Next came the time of wandering. He to Canada and Australia, and me to, deeper into the administrator's life. It took a while, but like Odysseus, he came back. Beside him, we discovered, was a wife. His wanderings included, like the classic tale, earned wisdom. He'd married his Penelope, the lovely and faithful Patricia Mannion. Lucky Digby. Patricia is a touchstone that brought Digby through many a storm. Encouraging, steadfast Penelope wove her belief into a garment for the future. She knew the demon and perhaps tamed it, or at least did not let it tame her. We owe her our thanks for keeping Digby connected to us and the legendary Lothario attached to his better angel. How did she do it? They lived in Penetanguishene, Ontario, at the end of Lake Huron. She worked in a prison dedicated to serial killers. And Digby, of course, found a way to put on a show with these men. <laughs> <laughs> he may not have thought it was so different from Hollywood. <laughs> It was there, with the hero's journey heavy in the air, with the snow piled up to the roof, the ice as thick as semi-trucks, where serial killers were singing <laughs> satirical ditties. <laughs> it was in that vortex of primal forces and surreal juxtapositions that our man, for all seasons, suddenly began whistling the wedding march. <laughs> you have some powers, Patricia. One-liner. Always borrow money from a pessimist. He won't expect it back. <laughs> Digby quotes. Yeah. Are they? No. They are just kind of in the spirit of Digby. Okay, okay. okay. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, and about that awkward business of his wandering away in our book? We divorced. <laughs> we signed letters making it official, me in my sensible shoes, and Digby in his traveling shoes. I went on to finish the book. It was published last fall. Why this turn in the narrative? Digby is a book. He is a book you want to see after being away. The familiar cover, the smell of cinnamon and caffeine, the glow is from a set of perfect teeth. You settle back in a chair opposite, raise any topic, and you are in Digby's world. He was that book that would never be written down. Like Homer, this book could only be spoken aloud, met in laughter exhorting you into new work and delivering a message that just fits your heart. Well, Dig, everyone in this room has those messages tucked away. It's not the whole book. It's not the James Digby Wolf definitive edition that was a dare to the impossible. But, Captain, my Captain, thank you for sharing your book with us. We are all more because we opened your book. So long, dear friend. My name is Susan Hennick. I'm married to Jay. And um, I've known Digby for a number of years. And uh, the last number of years before he became ill, he was living at our house periodically. And we always knew when he was coming, even though he hadn't announced it yet, because trails of Zappos boxes filled with white sneakers <laughs> all of a sudden mysteriously arrive at my house. And I'd say, Jay, guess what? Digby's on his way. <laughs> and uh, then we'd spend many hours uh, 
together uh, happily eating creme brulee. So now every time we eat creme brulee, we toast him. So this is a poem I wrote. Um, we were with him before he died and around the time he died. And this is a poem I wrote right after he died. Um, Digby Wolf, the boy, the loner, an aptly descriptive name for one who insisted upon embracing contradictions. Body gone, spirit hovering, too intense to disappear easily from the hearts of those who knew him. Painful bits trailing behind, even in death. He would never quite concede defeat, saved by his fierce intelligence, analytical clarity, raucous, incisive humor. The little blonde boy, quaking in the middle of the London Blitz, thrust into the unwelcome role of man of the house to mother and sisters, tap dancing his way out of the stranglehold of women, his perception, for most of the rest of his life. Though that lusty twinkle in his eye, the infectious laugh remained irresistible. Oh yes, he loved, admired, appreciated, but not for him the humdrum of every life, of everyday life, if he could help it. The duty, the responsibility, proof of entrapment. He reserved his deepest commitment for his students as teacher, for his writing and creative partners as collaborator and visionary, and a piece of himself for his friends as one of the small circle. But he lived most fully, at his purest, incommunicado, wandering happily inside himself, his imagination running wild, immersed in the river from which true art springs. Um, my name is Patricia Mannion, and I am Diggy's wife. Um, I want to thank every single one of you for being here and what you've shared. It would make Diggy's heart sing right now. Um, I don't have much to say, uh, but there was a poem that did be, once we found out how ill he was, began to repeat over and over and over again. Digby grew up um, by the sea. He played by the sea. He has so many memories of uh, stories by the sea. Um, when they heard over the wire that the Germans were coming and um, everyone in England was told to take anything that uh, the Germans could take to get rid of it. He and his little sister Hillary took their four foot dinghy out into the sea, stabbed a hole in it, sunk it, and very heroically swam back. So there are so many uh, references in his life and in his memories to water, to sea. And this is the poem he kept repeating um, endlessly for six weeks. I must go down to the sea. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and the sky. And all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. And the wheels kick and the wind's song and the white sails shaking and a gray mist on the sea's face and a gray dawn breaking. I must go down to the seas again for the call of the running tide it's a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day and the white clouds flying and the flung spray and the blown spume and the seagulls crying. 
I must go down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way, where the wind's like a wetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, and quiet sleep, and a sweet dream when the long trip's over. Thank you about that.